I remember that conference too. There's two things that I remember about uh, Nate at that conference. One of them is that he was beating up on Greg Kokel. Remember that, Nate? <laughs> and the other one I'm going to actually talk about tomorrow. But um, I really uh, appreciate being invited to come and speak here today. I really appreciate the encouragement that I've received from a lot of you who have been introduced to uh, the ministry that God has blessed me with. And um, I thank you for those kind words. My name is indeed Cy Ten Bruggenkate. Now, Ten Bruggenkate is a Dutch name. Ten is part of my last name, just like Corrie Ten Boom, like Van or De. Ten is a prefix to a Dutch last name, so when people call me Bruggenkate, they're, uh, they're missing a lot of the name. But a lot of the atheists like to call me Cy Ten, I think, because it sounds like Satan. So maybe if you're Australian, Satan. But uh, Ten Bruggenkate is actually my last name. Now, I had, um, I had removed this part, of, um, this part of my talk because I've just done it so often, and... Uh, you know, the joke is getting old, but then Mike introduced me. Well, in his talk, he talked about me. He talked about my degree, because one of the things that I like to talk, uh, tell people when I come and speak is that I am you up here. Eight years ago, I was working in a boiler room, taking readings on boilers and chillers and compressors. I'm you up here. I don't have a degree in philosophy or apologetics. I just had a passion for defending my faith, and like um, Nate said, I was doing it wrong. By the grace of God, he introduced me to presuppositional apologetics. But I say that's not entirely true. I do have a degree. I'm a DWAW. And for those who aren't familiar with that, I'm a dude with a website. <laughs> so that's what you have a, a, to aspire to. Then um, anybody uh, can share their faith and supposed to be able to do it. Well, that's what I tell people. I said that there's no um, office of apologist in Scripture. What if I came here today and say, I'm a love your neighborist? <laughs> what? <laughs> You can teach me how to love my neighbor? Why is there no office of apologist? Because we're all supposed to be able to do it. The fact that we can't do it is an indication that we're doing it wrong. Like I say, I spent um, over 20 years working in the boiler room. For those of you who are not familiar with the boiler room, just think of where every bad thing has ever happened in any movie you've ever seen. <laughs> That's where I spent over 20 years of my life. Boiler operator, not a boiler maker, as uh, a lot of people like to say. But I'm a boiler operator. I just push buttons, took readings, and... This is my website, proofthatgodexists.org. And uh, I think my introduction must be old because uh, Nate said that How to Answer the Fool was my latest film. But it's not, actually. I hope that you do pick it up there. The latest film is actually called Debating Dillahunty. And we came out with that a couple months ago. It's not available on DVD. And Marcus, who um, directed it and filmed it, he said it will never be available on DVD because uh, he wants people to come into the 21st century. But I've been fighting with him. It'll eventually be on DVD. See, if I say that, he says nobody's going to order the download. However, you have an incentive. If you use that code, if you go to debatingdelahunty.com and use that code, Herald Society, Florida 2015, you can get 50% off, I think, for the next three days or so. Now, the thing about the first film, I've had people come up to me and say, I watched your film and I hated you. I think because they didn't see the passion behind what I was trying to teach. And, um, you know, and I watched that too, and I think, you know, Actually, I was staying at Eric Hoven's place, who has a display out there. And um, he was playing it for some guests of his, and I was in the next room listening to it, and I thought, man, that guy is a jerk. <laughs> but I wasn't watching it either, so I think that, you know, you miss this, the, the, you know, what was actually going on at the time. And I'm really passionate about sharing my faith. But in this latest movie, Debating Delahunty, as Tony, his review isn't out yet, but he was saying that in the first film, he sees the mind of God in the apologetic, and in this one, he sees the heart of God in the apologetic. And uh, Marcus, one of his taglines for the film was, he says, I made you likable. So <laughs> I have to thank him for that. But I'm here to say, uh, today to talk to you about um, man-centered apologetics. Now, I don't know why Mike Stockwell got Christ-centered apologetics and I got man-centered apologetics, but I hope it's not uh, based on uh, experience and how we look when we're up there. Although, you know, I'm here to share with you today that we are all guilty of man-centered apologetics. If you saw me in that lobby... 10 minutes ago, looking at the clock, you'd say that's a man-centered fellow. We're not immune to this, you know. But I know that the Lord, no surprise, I love when Brian Tate says that. We had some, I spoke at one of his conferences a while ago, audiovisual problems. And I thought back to what Brian Tate said, there's no surprise, this is going exactly how God has intended it to go. And with that, I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this conference. We thank you, Lord God, that we can look into your word and seek to serve you, Lord God. Please help us leave here better equipped to serve you. And please make us serve you better. Please open my mouth, Lord God, to say the things that you would have me say and close it from the things that you would not have me say. 
and open the ears to the hearers to the things that you would have them hear and close the ears, Lord God, to the things that I might say that are incorrect. Lord God, we thank you for this time and we love you. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Now, um, I was asked to speak on uh, man-centered apologetics. And one thing, if you've been to any Herald Society before, is that all I do is I change the title of my uh, talk and I do exactly the same thing. <laughs> but one thing I tell people is that I don't have a lot to say. I have a few things that I want to say to a lot of people. That's why I quit my job eight years ago. So next year when I come, hopefully I won't say the same thing, but as Tony was sharing, that there's a lot of people here who have never heard of uh, presuppositional apologetics. But for those who have, I will be repetitive. And I apologize for that, but as, uh, as Eric's father always said, that uh, repetition is a good way to learn. And as Eric's father always said, repetition is a good way to learn. <laughs> he used that joke all the time, too. <laughs> um, Man-centered apologetics. Uh, I'm only going to focus on one of these areas, but I want to briefly go over them. These are things that will lead to man-centered apologetics. If you have a problem with your theology, your methodology, or idolatry. Now, idolatry doesn't really go, uh, doesn't rhyme with my titles here, so I've changed it to idolatry, and from now on, that's what we're going to call it. <laughs> so basically, um, problems with theology. If God is not sovereign in your theology, how can our apologetic not be man-centered? It must be. That's why what I teach is a Reformed apologetic, because God is sovereign over all things. Now, all Christians believe that God is sovereign, but it's just that in the outworking of that, it doesn't look that way. But, you know, we can't really get into that too much. If you want to ask in the um, Q&A this afternoon why presuppositional apologetics is necessarily reformed, I can get into that a little bit more. Now, methodology. You can have a great theology, and your methodology can mess up your apologetics. There are some wonderful preachers who shall remain nameless who have wonderful theology, but their apologetics is, I would say, not correct. <coughs> Archie Sproul. <coughs> no. No, I... No, okay. But your theology can be good, and your methodology can mess up your apologetic. But I would say a lot of times your theology, if it's messed up, it will mess up your theology necessarily. And the last one, of course, is idolatry. There are people who have a wonderful apologetic, but they mess it up because they fall in love with the argument. They idolize the argument. They idolize themselves for winning the argument. And this is one thing I want to caution people, even my dearest friends. And this is something that I have to be conscious of myself. If you're witnessing to somebody, and somebody happens upon that conversation, and if it does not look like you want that person to be saved, you're doing it wrong. That's man-centered. Even if you're using the right words, if it does not look like you want that person to be saved, you're doing it wrong. You see, we have to seek to win the person, not the argument. If you argue biblically, you will win the argument. But if you're not seeking to win the person, your words will fall on, fall on deaf ears. And uh, there's a story I want to share, too, about the power of this apologetic. I remember the first time I was at uh, Living Waters, I'd never actually debated or argued presuppositionally in the open air before. And as I did it with some people, it did not go well for them. And people were smacking me on the back as I was coming back to the Living Waters there. And they're saying, Sai, you crushed that guy. You creamed that guy. Elevating me. I said, I didn't. God did. See, because there's a danger in this apologetic, and, and this is what was happening. There was such a sickening buzz about this guy. I wasn't even one of the speakers there, but I was hanging around, and people were learning, and they were just loving it. They were seeing what was happening out in the street, and they were lifting me up. They were saying, this guy, you've got to listen to this guy. You've got to hear this guy. So at the end of the conference, as Tony knows, they put two mics up front to give testimonies. And like I say, there's this buzz going on about me, and I'm in the back praying, Lord, Please don't let anybody mention my name. Please don't let anybody mention my name. Lord, please don't let anybody mention my name. And I finished praying, and what was the first thought in my head? I hope somebody mentions my name. That's how insidious it is. So I ran up to the front, and I was the first one there, and I opened my Bible to Luke 17, and I read of the unworthy servant. So we are unworthy servants. See, the danger of this apologetic is... Well, the beauty of it is you're going to win arguments. The danger is you're going to win arguments. And people are going to think it's you. And that's why, you know, I would rather people see, pe see people do apologetics wrong than do it the right way and be hurtful and insulting to people. You have to remember that that is you out there when you defend your faith. But today I'm going to focus on um, methodology. Because that's what I do. I'm a presuppositionist. So I'm going to expose some of the 
errors of some of the apolog other apologetic methods. And the reason I do that is because sometimes people hear a talk on apologetics, they're so excited, they go out and they look everything up, up everything on YouTube and they get these famous apologists, they go, oh, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. And a lot of it is garbage. So apologetics, I normally do not define, especially in a group like this, everybody knows what it means, but I was at a Christmas event not too long ago and some fellow re related to somebody in my church says, does that mean we go around saying we're sorry to people? No, it doesn't. It comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to give a reasoned defense of your faith. Oh, did I have that up there? Yeah. A branch of theology concerned with defending the truth of Christianity. Now, what are my qualifications for teaching you today? Most of my life I was doing it wrong. Now, how does that qualify me? You know, some people say, like just somebody shared with me the other day that, you know, the, the, the whole issue of judgmentalism, that when they try to correct someone, they say, oh, you're judging people. Well, my qualification was that I was doing it wrong. And if you want somebody to tell you how to quit smoking, you want somebody that used to smoke. If you want somebody to help you with a certain sin in your life, you might want somebody who's overcome that sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm passionate about this because most of my life I was doing it wrong. And by the grace of God, he showed me what I think is a biblical apology. Like, what was I doing wrong? When a person told me that they didn't believe in God, I gave them evidence. Now that might shock you, for those of you who aren't familiar with my ministry. We gave them evidence. Well, what's the problem with giving evidence? One problem, you have to be brilliant. You have to know geology, biology, astrophysics, nuclear chemistry, rock layers. You have to know it all. And let's say you study rock layers, and you're really good at it. And you're out in the street talking to somebody about rock layers, age of the earth or whatever, you wipe the floor with this guy. What's he going to do when he gets home? Google rock layers. You want him to repent and put his trust in Jesus Christ and he's Googling rock layers. Congratulations. And what's the problem? He's going to find somebody who's an expert in rock layers. And I'm saying there's nothing wrong with that. As Christians, we should study that. But he's going to find somebody who might be smarter than you and he's going to come out and wipe the floor with you. You have to be brilliant. See, the problem is there's always somebody smarter than you. So if you want to study those things to examine God's glorious creation, go for it. But if you want to use it in argumentation, that's going to be the focus, and like I say, you're going to run into trouble. Here's another problem with evidence. You reduce God to a probability. Now here's the question. Do we believe in a certain God or a probable God? Romans 8, 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Christ Jesus our Lord. In church, we say nothing can separate us from the love of the Father. What do we say out in the world? Every building needs a builder. You see, in church, we talk about a certain God. Somebody says, I don't believe in God. Say, well, every building needs a builder. Something must have built it. That's not the God we talk about in church. We talk about a certain God in church. You see, if God is just some random builder, you can't say nothing can separate me from the love of the Father because you just don't know. See, but that's what the Bible says. I'm sure that's where they get that from. The heavens declare the glory of a builder. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. That's not what we say in church. That's not what Psalm 19 says. It's the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. We talk about a certain God in church. If God is not certain, you cannot say, nothing will separate me from the love of the Father. You see, God is not a builder. God is the builder. They know it, and they're without excuse for denying it. Now, I want that to sink in, because I've done this talk at an outreach with over 100 open-air preachers, and I thought it was sinking in. And then I'd go out and I'd listen to them. Oh, you don't believe in God? Every building needs a builder. Every building needs a builder. God is not a builder, he's a deal builder. I want that to sink into your head. I want it to be so powerful that you dream about it, like my friend David.
Okay, you don't, you don't have to dream about it, but God's not a builder, he's the builder. Now, let's look at some of the common arguments for the existence of God. We can't go through these, but I'm going to tell you here today that all of these arguments are probabilistic arguments. There must be some deity out there that's done all these things. And like I say in the Q&A, if you want to ask specifically about why that's the case, but they're all probabilistic arguments. And I want you to think about the most prominent apologist that you know. He's a proponent of one of these arguments, the Kalam cosmological argument. But I want you to hear what probabilistic argument for the existence of God amounts to. And this is him at Cambridge University. Craig, the most feared Christian apologist, is not arguing for the Christian God. He's arguing for a generic God. I have news for Mr. Lane Craig. Generic God does not exist. Amen. He's arguing for something I don't believe in. And I hope and I pray that he's arguing for something he doesn't believe in. I don't know if that's the case, because here he is at a, uh, looks like at a university. Do you have any for this Christian God and not any other God? You, Mr. Atheist, ought to rejoice in my argument tonight because I'm not arguing for the God of the Bible. That's right, he should rejoice. Probable or certain, he's arguing for a probability. Now, you would hope and you would pray that Mr. Craig does not believe in a probable God. I personally think that he says those things to have credibility with those people he debates with, those communities. Because I'm not really welcome in a lot of places when I talk about the certainty of God. They want me to be open-minded about that. I can't be open-minded about the very foundation of reasoning. But I want you to, this clip I just saw actually a little bit, a little while ago, and this one actually might explain why he says this thing that he does, but this, this for me was actually quite shocking. That's, that's the whole thing, we don't claim certainty, and that's right. Well, you claim certainty. No, no, I, 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 I didn't get that. Are you certain that God exists? No! Good. Are you certain that God exists? No! What does the atheist say? Good. No kidding. Good. Now, I hope that there's some kind of theological, logical explanation where he says, well, I really am certain, but I don't know. I don't get it. I'm just a boiler operator. 
I don't get it. There might be an explanation out there. I'm not beyond correction. I just don't get it. You see, what if I told you that I had a wonderful, loving relationship with my wife? I'm just not certain she exists. <laughs> you had every right to question my relationship, let alone my sanity. You see, the God we believe in certainly exists and has certainly revealed himself. If you're not defending your faith in that God, you're doing it wrong. What's the biggest problem with evidence? Where do you hear evidence out in the world? In the court of law. Who do you give evidence to in court? In court, you give evidence to the judge or the judge and the jury. Unbeliever comes up to you and says, I don't believe in God, and you give them evidence, who are you saying is the judge? Them. And in that courtroom, which seat does God occupy? The criminal's box. Brothers and sisters, that's why I do what I do. Because Christians, loving brothers and sisters, are putting God in the criminal's box and elevating the unbeliever to the position of judge. See, when we give evidence to the unbeliever, we're in danger of making them the judge over God. Now, I'm not pointing out these apologists to poke them in the eye. I hopefully I'm putting my arm around them and saying, you're not talking about the God we believe in. Brothers, please. Frank Turk, he goes to your university teaching your student, your children, how to defend their faith. We're going to show through two scientific arguments and one philosophical argument that there's a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator out there, and we're not going to use the Bible to show you that evidence. We're just going to give you evidence and let you see where it leads. We're just going to give evidence, you evidence, and make you the judge. We're not going to let the Bible decide. We're not going to let God be the authority. We're going to make you the judge. Personally, I think it's far more logical to draw conclusions based on the evidence. And I'm convinced that the evidence of science and history support the reliability of Christianity's traditional beliefs. I mean, let's not believe in the authority of the Bible merely because the Bible claims to be true. Let's look at modern cosmology, physics, biochemistry, and genetics, all of which point powerfully toward a supernatural creator who looks suspiciously like the God of the Bible. He looks suspiciously like the God of the Bible. Now, I love his books. I love his books. Why do I love his books? Because I'm a Christian. There's wonderful stuff in there for Christians, but if you use that to defend, defend your faith, you're putting the unbeliever in the judges. See, look at his, one of his books here, The Case for a Creator. Who is the judge for that book? Who are we making a case for? The unbeliever. God needs no case. Evidence for God. Evidence that demands a verdict. By who? By the unbeliever. Let me give you some evidence so you can judge, not my God. We put God on trial. Oh, we don't do that. We would never do that. We've never tried Jesus, would we? We wouldn't do that. Try the Lord of glory? We wouldn't do that. We put on our bumper stickers, brothers and sisters. We put on our t-shirts. We put on our church signs. Try Jesus. Try the Lord of glory. But surely a megachurch pastor would not go on national TV and tell the nation to put Jesus on trial. Surely that wouldn't happen. Not here. What, about, what does it say to all those people who do not accept Christ as a person? I would say that this is a perfect time to open their mouth to give them a chance. I said, give them a 60 day trial. Is that I dare you to put Jesus on trial. 60 days. Put him on trial for 60 days. Who in Scripture tried Jesus? Pontius Pilate. And he only did it for a few hours. If Pontius Pilate didn't repent, he's in hell. And we're telling people to try Jesus. You do not try the Lord of glory. Scripture said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And we have Christians in droves going to these movies. Uh-oh, there's no God. Christian student, what's he going to do? He's been confronted by his nasty professor. There is no God. What's he going to do? Not my God. I'm not going to put my God on trial. My God is the judge. Now, I don't want to really knock this movie. Apparently there's some really good stuff. I have seen it, but when I heard that, I almost did a backflip. 
We don't put God on trial. Any God that we are the judge over is not God. We don't try the Lord of glory. We submit to him. Now, I want to caution you. Evidence is a wonderful gift of God to declare his majesty. Do not use it to make the unbeliever the judge over God. Now, you might be out there saying, well, I'm a Christian because of the evidence. Somebody shared evidence with, with me, and I, I became a Christian. I submitted my life to Jesus Christ. I became a Christian. He saved me. You know, of course, I believe that happens, because most people are defending their faith wrong. But God can use a bent stick to strike a straight blow. Or as my friend Mike says, he can use a bent arrow to hit a bullseye. <laughs> so he can do that. But it doesn't mean we should endorse bent arrows or bent sticks. I want to uh, caution you, too, there's a difference between sharing your faith and defending your faith. See, I go for a walk at night and I look at the stars, and you know, I actually, it's happened to me a couple of times that I've laughed. I look up at the stars and I laugh, and I think, how can anybody say there's no God? I don't laugh at their plight because it's a horrible plight. I laugh at their folly. The folly of saying there's no God. And if I want to say to an unbeliever, man, I looked at the stars last night and God declared his glory, so do it. Talk about the complexity of the eye. Talk about rock leaders if you're declaring the glory of God. But if he says you're nuts for what you believe, I'm not in sharing my faith mode anymore. Now I'm in defending my faith mode. Now here's the question, though. Who actually needs evidence that God exists? Who really needs evidence that God exists? Well, how do we find out as Christians the answer to that question? Do I take a poll? Find out, you know, who do you think needs evidence that God exists? Do I take a survey? Do I arm wrestle you? No, that, that wouldn't work out. How do I find out who needs evidence that God exists? We go to his word. And in Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, for God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. I can't tell you how many times I read that verse and went out and tried to prove that God exists to people. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, according to that verse, those verses, who needs evidence that God exists? Nobody. Why not? Because they already know. Thanks a lot. I think we're back on time. <laughs> they already know. No one needs evidence for God. If you remember nothing else about this talk, remember this. Everyone knows that God exists. It'll change the way you defend your faith. So, here's the question. Why do apologetics? If everyone knows that God exists, why do apologetics if God tells us in his word? And I, don't know, I know I've been knocking William Lane Craig, but he did go to Australia, and he actually read from scripture why we do apologetics. I have to share some thoughts this evening on helping Christians to become everyday apologists. The Bible commands us always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. And so every Christian is to have an apologetic case or defense ready to give when called upon to do so. Amen. 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared. That's what he said, right? Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you, do, that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. That's what he said, isn't it? Right? That's what he said. Let me see. I was asked to share some thoughts this evening on helping Christians to become everyday apologists. The Bible commands us always be ready. Yep, that's what he said. Always be ready to give an answer. You notice I left a little space on the top of that verse there, because that's not where that verse starts, brothers and sisters. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give a defense of your faith. Now, I don't know if William Lane Craig is a brother. I hope he is. But that is why you have poor methodology. Because you don't set apart Christ as Lord. You see, we do not argue to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. As other speakers have been saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. We start there when we defend our faith. Well, here's the question. What is our ultimate authority? God and his word. Is that how we're taught to defend our faith with the authority of God's word? Here's the question. I'll try and uh, shorten this up since we're running out of time here. But here's the question. What can you not use to prove that the Bible is true? Here's a, a famous Josh McDowell's son, John McDowell, uh, Josh McDowell, was at a conference and he asked the crowd that very question. He said, what can we not use to prove that the Bible is true? And I want you to listen to what they shouted out to him. They notice something 
God about this? If you want to know if the Bible is true, what can you not use to prove that the Bible is true? The Bible! The Bible! What can you not use to prove that the Bible is true? The Bible! Now what if I stood up here today and I claimed that I was the strongest man in the world? Of course, you might have thought that already just by my physique. But let's say I came up here and said, um, I'm the strongest man in the world. What can I not use to prove that I'm the strongest man in the world? Your strength! Crazy. Ultimate authority claims must prove themselves. Otherwise, they lose that authority. What must you use to prove that the Bible is true? You must use Scripture. Otherwise, it loses that authority. If you use something else, that becomes the authority. Now, we're not saying the Bible is true because the Bible is true. We're saying the Bible is true, and it proves it to be true, and if you deny it, your worldview is absurd. It's not a viciously circular argument. But here, this analogy might help here. It's, I saw this online. It's a, uh, the most powerful substance on earth. It will dissolve anything instantly on contact. Now, I'm just a poor apologist, so I couldn't afford that much of it. I can only afford a little jar full. The most powerful substance on earth will dissolve anything instantly on contact. How do you know I'm lying to you? It's in a jar. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, that's exactly what we're doing with the Bible. This is the ultimate authority, and I'm going to use something else to prove it. No. The Bible must prove itself. That's not what we're being taught. The foundation of our faith is not the scripture. The foundation of our faith is not the infallibility of the Bible. The foundation of our faith is something that happened in history. And the issue is always who is Jesus. That's always the issue. When I deal with having a quick list say, hey, this is one of the thoughts of Jesus. This is that story we were going on about to make people riding around the garden. And who would believe that? And there are many creations. But here's why I believe this actually happened. Not because the Bible says so, but because the gospel, Jesus talked about Adam and Eve. You know, I thought somebody posted that as a spoof that was on their website for one day. He doesn't believe it because the Bible says so, but because Jesus says so. In the Bible. <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you can't defend Christianity by giving up Christianity. But I know why so many people are intimidated when they go out and share their faith. It's because of that scary verse in, in the psalm, Psalm 14. The brilliant mathematician says in his heart there is no God. No wonder we're afraid. We might run into that guy. Oh, wait a minute. That's not what it says. It's the scholarly scientist who says in his heart there is no God. No. Actually, it's the amazing atheist who says in his heart, no, that's why we should be afraid to share our faith, to defend our faith. Brothers and sisters, it's the fool that has said in his heart, there is no God. We don't go around calling these people fools, but in my next talk tomorrow, we're going to talk about the apologetic that I teach, I think the biblical apologetic, to expose the foolishness of unbelief. You see, I'm not an evidentialist. I'm a presuppositionalist. This is my friend Dustin Seegers at the Reason Rally. If you look up presuppositionalism in the dictionary, you should see that picture. That's him arguing with an atheist. That's Dustin Seegers on the right and atheist on the left. And you see Dustin not looking at his face. And the atheist, just like he was. That's why we're commanded to do with gentleness and respect, because you're destroying worldviews, brothers and sisters. I just want to show you a, a promo from the film that I have out there. And um, hopefully you'll pick it up. We have two different ones here. This is the um, one with the study guide. That's for a suggested donation of $20. This one here, that's the film itself, but it doesn't have the study guide with it. And you can have this for any donation from one penny up to a million dollars. And uh, if you want to donate more than a million dollars, please take two. <laughs> Anyhow, here's the promo for the film. The fool has said his heart, there is no God. Now imagine something come up and said, I don't think it works. You think that he was a fool. You wouldn't pull out a dictionary and give him evidence. And you wouldn't believe him. Somebody comes up to you and says, I don't believe in God. We know not think they're a fool. We give them evidence and we believe them. When the Bible calls them fool, something has gone wrong.
So if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to get it, but I will actually share with you that one other thing that um, I remember about Nate from that conference. Because Nate came up to me and I didn't know him at all, it was the first time I ever met him, and he said, Si, I hear you're a really good apologist. I want you to teach me. All I do is answer with scripture. I said, brother, don't listen to a word I say. If you can do that, that's the presupposition. God's word is authoritative. That's the power of our argument. Let's close with prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this time that we could share together, Lord God. We thank you for how mighty and majestic you are. Help us, Lord God, to get out of the way when we share our faith, but just to shine the light on your glory, Lord God. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.